Do you get it? It's an interrupting no. cow. He interrupts. That's what Come he does. On. He's a like, moo, that, right? That is so dumb. It's a knock joke. Dumb. It's joke. funny. Hey, oh, she's like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What are you doing? It's me. It's Jesus. Lord, we take up our cross every day for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, but the cross is where it begins, not ends. Thou art the beginning and the end, Lord, Alpha and Omega. It's all about you, oh. Jesus. Uh, guys, I, I just want you to be real with me. <laughs> you are the air I breathe. <laughs> You are the air I breathe. <laughs> Drew, I think it's great when you worship me. Oh, yes. Praise you, Lord Jesus. It's just that sometimes it feels like you're putting on a show. Oh, Jesus, please forgive me for putting on a show and oh, being fake. Uh, okay, I, I forgive you. Oh, praise you for okay. your grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Guys, just say what you would normally say. Praise the Luya. No, I mean, like, you know, if, if we were talking, you know, say what you'd say. Okay, um, Drew, tell us a joke. What? Yeah, I mean, you know, like you were before. Thou art holy, Lord. That's not a joke. Oh, no, I, I didn't mean that. What are you guys doing? Jesus, we're living for you just like we always do. Don't live for me, live in me. When you live in me, you'll understand who you are and what you're living for. I just want something a little bit deeper. But... If this is all you want. <sighs> the authentic life, right? So, little confession right up front. If you were here with us last week, I told you my story about how kind I was to the guy at Cox when my internet was out for three days. So, I don't know if this was God's sense of humor or if this was, you, Kelly, you still need to learn something. But we got home from church on Sunday and guess what? No internet. And Scott was like, are you going to call? And I said, no, I'm just going to get the same answer, so we're just going to wait. So apparently I learned something. <laughs> so we are <coughs> in this two-part series where we're digging into the book of Colossians to, to discover Jesus and to discover who Jesus is and how God has called us to live <laughs> like I said last week, it is my desire that you have an authentic life. A life where you can be real with others. A life where you can be real with your creator. That your relationship with Christ, that your daily walk with Christ would be real. That you would be open and honest with him. And that you would see your savior for who he is and what he has done for you. That your relationship would not just be something you, you talk about with the right people or something you do on Sunday morning, but that your faith would be what influences the decisions that you make, the things that you do. That faith would inform how you speak, how you live in this world, and how you react to tough or frustrating situations. See, Jesus, through his life, his death, his resurrection, he paved the way for you to have a personal relationship with Jesus, with God the Father, an authentic relationship with your creator. And it's my hope that your authentic faith would influence every aspect of your life and that you would grow to be authentic with others, people that you run into, people that you do life with every day, people that God has placed in your life. And so we're using this letter that Paul wrote to the church of Colossa, a church that had allowed the truth of who Jesus was to kind of get mixed with things of the day 
a little bit of paganism thrown in there, and a little bit of Jewish Judaism, and then some Greek thought. And Paul is not going to have any of it. He puts it all on the line. This is who Jesus is. He, this is who you want to have an authentic relationship with. And so last week we went through Colossians 1 and 2 and we discovered Jesus. The Jesus that Paul was willing to give his life for. And if you missed it, because all you got to do after the service is grab your Bible, read Colossians 1 and 2, and perhaps discover Jesus in a fresh way. Today, we're going to look at the other side of the coin, though. We looked at Jesus and who he was, and we're going to look at how to have this authentic relationship with Jesus, what we need to do, who we need to be becoming like, and how to use Jesus as an example as we continue to move forward in this life to become more and more like Jesus. So today we're going to move through Colossians 3 and 4. And today we're going to start with a death. The death of our old nature. Colossians 2 ended with our death and new life. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the power, from the spirit of the world. See, and if that verse just ended right there and Colossians 1 and 2 were it, we would all just get up and go home and be like, this is so cool. My old life is over. It's dead. But Paul doesn't leave us there. Wouldn't that be nice? I can just go home and be OK. The next sentence starts with, so why? Why do you keep doing the things that you do? Why do you keep following earthly rules? They provide no help in conquering one's evil desires. See, the church that he was writing to, the people of the Colossians, had made all these rules that you needed to follow. Rules that kind of trickle into the church today. You know, they seem good. They make us feel good. You know, we're doing something right. Look at me. I'm following the rules. I'm behaving the way I'm supposed to in this nice little box. It makes us look all like moral on the outside. But religious rules can't change someone's heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And that's why Jesus came. He fulfilled all the rules that the Jewish people had been attempting to live by in the Old Testament. And he left us with two. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first this commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbors as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. This is what our moral compass is supposed to be about. It's what it's based on. It's kind of what we say around here so often. Love God, love people. It's that simple. Love God, love people. Our moral behavior, our ethical behavior is influenced by those two things. Love God, love people. That's Jesus. Jesus who lives within us once we accept him. Jesus who's doing a work in each and every one of us, shaping us into who he has called us to be and what he has called us to do. So Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Think. It all starts in the mind. Right? It all starts in how we think. 
ever go there where everything seems to be okay and then you start thinking of something and all of a sudden you're down this rabbit trail, right? And you're like, where in the world did I get there? Why is my thought process now all messed up? Think about the things of heaven, not about earth. We're a work in progress. Scott uses that line on me all the time. Babe, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> Colossians 3, verse 10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Put on a new nature and be renewed as you learn. Not, I've accepted Jesus and now I'm... Ta -da! No. As we learn... As you learn to become like your creator. As you learn who your creator is and what he has done for you. So jumping back up to verse 5 through 9. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idler. Idolater, sorry, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when you're still part of it. Anger, rage, malice behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all the wicked deeds. Put on your new nature. Learn to know your creator and become like him. It's not saying, okay, I'm going to be up here now because I've accepted Jesus. Learn. Put it on. Practice. Practice those behaviors. See, the more that you practice, the more it becomes second nature. It's more than just like working hard and making those resolutions. It's as straightforward as putting on the behavior the way we put on a new outfit. Now, guys, you might not get this because, you know, new outfits aren't usually that big of a deal. But ladies, how do you feel when you put on a new outfit? You know, something really pretty, something really glittery and glamorous or something really comfy and cozy, it affects who you are. You begin to behave differently because you feel better about yourself. Put on a new nature. Fit in it. Start acting the way Jesus has called you to act. Allow it to make you feel more and more like that new nature. And what is this new nature that we're putting on? See, now we're getting to the heart of who we are becoming. Colossians 3, starting at verse 12, says, God chose you to be holy people he loves. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and our favorite one, patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds all of us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love, harmony, peace. Sounds like the 60s are calling us. Love, harmony, peace, thankfulness. These are the things that Jesus is calling us to be about. And then I'm guessing that for those of you who read ahead when I gave you the assignment last week to read Colossians 1 and 2, and you read ahead, 
you're just waiting. You're waiting for the next section and wondering if I'm going to skip it. See, all of the words of advice and guidance from Paul, and then we come to the next section, and there's Fred reading ahead to the next section with a little smirk on his face right now. Why? See, this section comes right after this peace and harmony and living together with thankfulness. And it starts out with this. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. You're all laughing. <laughs> Chris is really laughing over there. Good advice, thou, really, for wives, for husbands, for ch children, for fathers. Submit. See, wives, you know this new freedom you found in Christ? Don't abuse it. You know, can you imagine the first church? Women had no value. And now Jesus comes along and says, you have value. Just the same way as a man. Just the same way as a master. Just the same way as a slave. You have value. You all have value. But don't abuse it. Be honoring. It's the right thing for those who belong to God. And who are you honoring? The husband who treats his wife with love, who treats his wife the opposite of harsh, kind, merciful, patient, accepting, compromising, responsive, <laughs> wow, <laughs> willing, agreeable, flexible, that's the opposite of harsh. And it could go on and on and on. Who wouldn't want to submit to that? This isn't the only time that Paul wrote to the churches about this subject. To the church in Ephesus, he says, submit to one another. Before he goes on and talks about wives and husbands, submit to one another. Another beautiful example of way, the way you can show an authentic life, the way you can set an example of an authentic marriage for the world around us. And then Paul wraps up his instructions to the Colossians with this instruction, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be grace, gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response to everyone. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity to show Jesus, to be kind, to be gracious, to give someone a smile. I had so much fun yesterday. I was at the store. This little girl was in the cart with her mom, and she's just sitting there. She's about three. And we made eye contact, and I smiled at her. And her whole body, like, lit up. Have you ever done that with kids? It's so much fun, because kids are the unseen, usually. Make the most of every opportunity. Be an example of Christ for those who have not yet accepted him. What an amazing guide to becoming more like Jesus. What to do, how to behave. Exciting, overwhelming, unattainable, scary. Maybe for you, you're sitting here going, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm OK. I, I kind of am a really nice person, and I try really hard. 
and then you remember it's about your thought process, right? It's about what you think. It's about what you think of the person who just cut you off on the highway. How do you think about them? Or, or maybe you're getting this little jab right now because there's something. There's a behavior. There's a habit. There's a way that you think. There's a way that you speak. There's a way that you look at someone who you view as less than. Maybe it's time for a turnaround. Maybe it's time for you to lay it all out on the line, to be authentic to Jesus, and to say, here's my thing. Here's my habit. Here's my addiction. Here's my hurt. Here's why I act the way I do. Maybe it's time for a turnaround. Maybe it's time to say, okay, God, it's time for me to take that off, to put this on, and to focus on you. Seeing if your first thought is, but I'm only human. I'm a work in progress. I keep making the same mistakes, but I'm a work in progress. We need to remember. We need to write down. We need to tattoo on us. Colossians 3, verse 10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become more like him. As you learn to know this Jesus who loves you so much, to grow to understand him and what he did. What he did at the beginning of time. What he did when he walked on this earth. What he did when he died on a cross. What he did when he rose from the dead. What he did when he returned to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Speaking on your behalf. This is the Jesus who loves you. Grow to understand your Jesus so you can become more like him. See, this is why I love this letter to the Colossian church. See, you are re reassured of who you are and whose you are. Colossians 1.22 Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Chapter 2, 13 and 14. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against you and took away by nailing it to the cross. Because of who you are and because of whose you are, you are able to do more than you could possibly imagine through the power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down deep into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with faithfulness. Chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. In Colossians 2, 6, And now just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him again. Let your roots grow down deep and let your lives be built in him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth and you, the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. See, we're on this journey. Every single one of us 
once we begin not just accepting Christ, but once we begin investigating, who is this Jesus? Once we begin that investigation, Jesus starts to work. The Holy Spirit starts to poke and to prod inside of us, pointing us in the, to the direction that God is calling us to be. So whether you're a new believer, or maybe you're thinking about becoming a believer, or you've been a believer for years, as long as you can remember, the Holy Spirit is at work inside of you, continuing to work in you. Get to know your Savior. And while you do your part in the relationship, understanding Jesus and practicing behaviors, the Holy Spirit will continue to guide you, continue to lead you, to point you. One of the most important aspects of all of this is how Paul starts his letter and how he starts almost all of his letters and how he ends his letters. He reminds us that we gain strength through prayer, that we gain strength through conversation with our Heavenly Father. Paul, right as he opens his letter, he says this, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the, endur the endurance and the patience that you need. In Colossians 4, starting at verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plans concerning Christ. That, why, that is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. And then a personal church, Epirus, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Jesus Christ, sends you greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Lacedonia and Hieropachus. The power of prayer. The power of pouring out your heart to God. See, next week we begin a series on prayer, and you're not going to want to miss it. The power that comes when we sit at the foot of the cross and we pour our hearts out to a living Savior who wants to change our lives and point us in the direction he has called us to be. And so we close today with this instruction from Paul. Chapter 3, 16 and 17. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill our lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with a thankful heart. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Verse 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies, high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God. You also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. The authentic life begins with knowing Christ, building a relationship with him, building a relationship with the Father through him. So you must continue to follow his leadership, to allow yourself to be rooted in who he is. Christ wants to guide you, to help you with your everyday problems, with your everyday life to shape you into who he's called you to be. So I'm going to leave you with an assignment once again this week. I left you with one last week. This week, 
I want you to grab your handout. I want you to write on the top of it, read Colossians 3 and 4. Dig into it. Ask God to help you understand what he is saying to you personally. Pay attention to those action steps that Paul gives on how to become more like Jesus. And note how Paul uses prayer, how he is calling us to pray, to really pray. And then join us next week as we dig into what it's like to have a conversation with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time, and I, I thank you that you desire nothing more than the realness of who we are. So God, I pray that we would come to you with our hurts, with our brokenness, with our joys and our laughter, that we would come to you with celebrations and needs. And God, I pray that in this, we would discover you. We would discover a Jesus who sets an example for us that we would become more and more like the Father. God, we pray for those who are with us this morning. We pray for the ongoing struggles for Rich as he continues with his health issues. We pray for Jane Peterson, who too is not with us again this morning. And God, we thank you that Judy is here and Audrey is here, and we pray for their continued health as well. We pray that you would walk alongside Judy as she continues to battle cancer. God, we know that you are her rock. So God, we pray that you would also be the rock that we need, that we would see you and that we would follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.